Let's do a top five this, shall we? Jerry Anderson brought to the screen just some of the most amazing vehicles in science fiction history. So, I'm gonna give you my top five Jerry Anderson vehicles. And number five, we've got Skydiver, the submarine from UFO. The Skydiver vessels are a series of four submarines that patrol the Earth's oceans and waterways and their primary mission is intercepting any UFOs that have breached moon bases defences and got as far as Earth. In the show, what happens is if a UFO has got into Earth's atmosphere, it's got past SID, it's got past all of the UFO interceptors on moon base, Skydiver will be alerted to its presence and the front section of the submarine will detach and becomes a fighter aircraft. It will launch from the ocean and intercept any UFOs that are in Earth's atmosphere loitering or causing trouble. Its mission doesn't end there though because what it is, it's on patrol 24-7. There's Like I said, there's four of them and there was another six of them planned I think in the UFO universe but we only know of four in operation. One of them is actually destroyed in the episode Subsmash, but the alien menace in the UFO TV series likes to operate in underwater type scenarios because Earth's atmosphere actually degrades their spaceships. They start to sort of melt and fall apart and stuff in Earth's atmosphere. And also their ability to maneuver and speed and everything is severely hampered by Earth's atmosphere. Hence the reason a submarine fighter jet is able to intercept them on such a regular basis. They operate from a series of hidden bases around the world at strategic locations. They're 130 foot long and they've got a crew of six with the addition of any other shadow personnel that may be relevant to the job they're doing at the time, such as like Ed Straker, for instance, he would like invariably go off and have adventures on one of the skydivers despite his claustrophobia and the reason it's on the list aside from the fact that it is the coolest ship in ufo and the coolest vehicle you'll see in ufo although that is open to debate i was arguing with somebody the other day about whether the shadow mobile is cooler or the shadow interceptor from moon base is cooler i don't care this is my list my channel and that is my favorite one i think in the broader sense of Jerry Anderson's works, Skydiver is quite an important step there. And it's because of where it falls in the creative mind of Jerry Anderson and all of the people around him as well, because it wasn't just a one man show. He had thousands of people working with him to create these absolutely amazing shows. But what Skydiver represents to me when I say that is Jerry Anderson had already started to develop and experiment with some really adult and mature themes in Captain Scarlet. I've done a video about that not too long ago, it's up there. I think it was a sign of him getting a bit more mature with his vehicle design. Okay, yeah, it's a submarine that's like vastly superior to anything operated by the world's militaries in typical Jerry Anderson-esque style and you know, it launches a fighter from it. It's completely impractical looking and it's far-fetched science fiction. But I think it represents a step towards more realism in his design. And by that, I mean, if you look at everything previous in Jerry Anderson Productions, it was, everything suffered from gigantism. Everything was really over the top and overstated and loud and brash and sleek and fast. Whereas the Skydiver, it's got this really muted bronze goldy color palette to it and it tiptoes around the world's oceans like a submarine does with stealth and it's small it's smaller than a los angeles class attack sub and i think it's demonstrating a little bit more maturity to match the show and the context that it's in the whole design of it and that is why skydiver makes it onto my list at number five number four Stingray, the finest submarine ever devised by man, and also the prettiest. Operated by the World Aquanaut Security Patrol, or WASP for short. You've only got to take one look at it and look at those 1960s lines it's got to it and how just 
bonkers looking it actually is to see why it is on my list it's beautiful and i love it captain by troy tempest and his lovable sidekick foams and crude as well by marina i suppose but she don't say much she ain't got much personality fun fact actually in universe stingray was originally commanded by captain gray out of spectrum alongside none other than gordon tracy it evolved from apparently in universe a design called the fresher class and the swordfish class it's 80 foot long and has a cruising speed of 600 knots which is just blisteringly fast for something that goes underwater it's armed with aqua sting missiles which can dispatch a variety of other undersea alien vehicles with just absolute ease in particularly the terror fish from stingray and it's really important in the lineage of all jerry anderson vehicles and vessels and spaceships and things like that because of where it falls in the production run of jerry anderson shows so it was made in 1964 i think stingray was first produced which was just before thunderbirds so all of the skill set that I was developing for Stingray went to much greater use in subsequent shows, in particularly Thunderbirds. From the outset, the show was really technically very ambitious. Shooting scenes that are supposedly underwater is very difficult, and Jerry Anson developed his own way of doing that, and what they would do would be they'd film the models and props and everything behind the water tank filled with like fish and all that kind of stuff. But as well, the show's important in British television history in general. It was the first show ever made in colour for British television. It wasn't actually shown in colour on British television until many years later, though. But again, that Jerry Anson-esque attention to detail is very present there and subtle things in it, like when Stingray leaves Marineville and goes through the tunnel and it erupts into the wider ocean that bubble spurt that you see every time it does that, they actually rigged a air pump to do that every time Stingray came out. It was only ever shot once and they got it on the one take, I think, as well. So hats off to them. But let's have it right. It's on my list because it's a cool name for a cool ship on a very cool show. Now, this one was originally intended to be my number two slot, but you will see when we get to number two, just why it was bumped down to number three. So sorry, any Captain Scarlet fans out there, I do feel your pain on this one because, you know, I was humming and ahhing about doing it. But number three is the SPV, the Spectrum Pursuit Vehicle. One of the most awesome cars to ever appear in anything ever. So you Knight Rider fans out there can kiss my ass, I'm afraid. So in universe, the SPV is developed from a tank called the Zeus fighting vehicle or something or other but it's been highly modified and developed by spectrum for use in more civilian settings but it is still an absolute beast of a vehicle it's properly tooled up and all it's got a rapid fire cannon on the front of it its armor is impenetrable to anything i think even angel interceptors can't get through the armor on it it's got a massive battering ram on the front. It's still got its tank tracks on the back for rough terrain. It is amphibious as well. It can do a top speed of 50 miles an hour on the water still. And on land, its top speed is 200 miles an hour. Trust me, the SPV is one of the most coolest things ever devised for science fiction. And to be quite honest with you, it was wasted in a children's show. Spectrum has got just thousands of these in strategic locations around the world on Spectrum bases mainly, but in the field they're hidden in just the most amazing and imaginative ways. Like they're hidden in like a pile of logs, for instance, or in an oil tank somewhere, or they're in, on the back of a lorry that completely just dismantles itself so the vehicle can get out of it. But what we're seeing with the SPV here in terms of Jerry Anderson and the lineage of Jerry Anderson is he's taking real world things that were happening at the time and just pushing them to the, to what would be his logical extreme and the logic of the Jerry Anderson universe extreme and what I think the inspiration of this may have come from would be 
So in the Cold War, you had these two armies facing off against each other in Europe and NATO forces were fully expected just, to just have to just retreat um, against this onslaught of these vastly superior numbers of like Soviet forces. So what they did was they arranged for these stay behind units and what their job would be would be to just stay behind in strategic locations, hidden, and then just pop out when needed, do some damage and then retreat. But in Jerry Anderson's mind, that turns into, okay, let's strategically place these vehicles around the world in the way that the Americans have strategically placed all of their equipment in Europe, like the forward operating bases and everything, for them to come in with just the men later on to operate them. And he's pushed that to a Jerry Anderson level of extreme and gone, okay, so let's dot these SPVs around the world for when they're needed and Spectrum can just go and get them. And that saves the logistics of having to transport them to any spot kind of thing that you need. And in typical Jerry Anderson fashion, out of that you get the SPV, this, this tank turned APC turned pursuit vehicle. It's just absolutely amazing. The colour of it is brilliant. I mean, it's got two ejector seats. What ain't cool about ejector seats on a car? Now, you sit backwards facing it. And I'll, I'll tell you a secret, right? My, my dad used to drive a London taxi. And in those London taxis, you've got these jump seats that face backwards in them. So you've got the main seat at the back, but you've got two or three extra jump seats in there. And if you're a kid whose dad's a cab driver and you just watched an episode of Cats in Scarlet, trust me, you are making every journey in that car facing backwards, just like Captain Scarlet and Captain Blue do. But for all that, the main reason the SPV is on my list of coolest Jerry Anderson vehicles ever is purely and simply because out of everything in Captain Scarlet, all the design and all the most fantastic spaceships and airplanes and everything you see in it, it's dark themes and concepts. The SPV just stands out as something just really special. It's really cool in a cool show. And to be honest with you, Captain Scarlet is probably the most technically excellent of all of the supermarination shows that Jerry Anderson ever made. And now you're gonna see why I had to bump the SPV down to number three. Because at number two, and this is gonna be controversial, I know, but this does have a real following and a real fandom developing around it. So, 102 feet long, four nuclear fusion reactors, a top speed of about 15% the speed of light. This is real Jerry Anderson territory here, innit? So, just as I said with Skydiver down at number five, I actually think as well, the Eagle Transporter represents a further shift forward in terms of realism in Jerry Anderson design. Gone are the Cadillac-esque tail fins of Stingray. Gone is the gigantism of Thunderbird 2. And we are now arriving at something which is visually very interesting to look at, but also visually very quite believable for something that we will develop in the near future as what it was in 1975, I think, when they made Space 1999. When you look at other Jerry Anderson stuff, and you look at the Funbirds vehicles, for instance, there's, you can see what they do and how they're supposed to work kind of thing, but it's never as clear as it is with an Eagle Transporter. It's three basic components. You've got a cockpit, you've got a superstructure, and then you've got an engine pod at the back. And the midsection of it is interchangeable. Something which is kind of desirable in a spaceship, even in real life. We see these used in many different capacities in Space 1999. They, they can carry lab modules, for instance, winches. There's a specialised rescue version of it, which you recognise actually because it's red and white. Um, but I honestly think as well, within Jerry Anson Productions, the Eagle is the first time since Thunderbirds where you've got a vehicle that directs the storytelling. And what I mean by that is, say for instance, you've got an episode of UFO, that can happen without seeing any of the primary vehicles of that. They can have really character-based stories in them and all that kind of thing. 
But you'd also get that with Captain Scarlet as well. They could do episodes where you didn't need to see an SPV or an angel or anything like that. You could have an episode just, just around Captain Scarlet going undercover and you, like, you can get away with it. But from the outset of Space 1999, you're going to run out of story ideas pretty quickly in that kind of scenario. So what the Eagle does in narrative terms is it, it gives them a, a avenue out of that. It gives them a mechanism where they can go and explore whatever planet they're passing, for instance, or they've crashed one on the other side of the moon and it's all about rescuing them or something like that. And that is why I think they just threw the book at the design of this thing to start with, because they knew it was going to be so crucial to the show. And let's have it right. What a cool toy to get as well. I actually think as well, when I watch Deep Space Nine, for instance, I can really see the eagle there in that show. And by that, I mean the three runabouts that Deep Space Nine has available to it. They, they represent the eagle in Space 1999. That modular kind of spaceship design that could be used for many different tasks from fighters to transports to science labs. It's lifted directly out of Space 1999. There's no odds in that. But apart from its influence on broader science fiction and the influence on the storytelling it had and the just amazing looks of it as well and the utility of the design within the show. But it's got a very kind of grounded look about it. And you can definitely see that in the future, vehicles that are in use on the moon could potentially resemble an eagle, for instance. It wouldn't take much really to sort of rejig the design of the alpaca. Now, the alpaca is a proposed design for a lunar lander for the Artemis program. It's amazing, it's a very, very capable design actually. I think it's by Sierra Space, I'm not sure who designed it. But they're moving forward with this design and the basic eagle kind of concept is there within it. That lattice work structure with a habitation pod in the middle slash command pod, two rocket engines on it and these disposable fuel tanks as well. And that's why the eagle's at number two. So this is where the controversy is really going to happen for me. I'm going to take so much shit off of you guys. I can actually see the bricks and everything being thrown at me now. Just be gentle, I bruise easy. So we're at number one and I'm going to qualify this by saying choosing any of the Thunderbird machines would be like asking me to choose between one of my children. It is whichever one is my favourite on that day actually. No, I, I kid. Um, they're all as equally as brilliant as each other in that show. They are just some of the most influential and fun and coolest looking machines ever in science fiction. And I love them all dearly, even Thunderbird 5. I, I enjoy Thunderbird 5's appearances. And I actually don't mind John Tracy neither actually. So with that in mind, the number one Jerry Anderson vehicle is Fab One. The shockingly pink Rolls Royce driven by the famous Aloysius Parker, butler, chauffeur, and <laughs> safe cracker, and spy for international rescue, and Lady Penelope, Crichton Ward. As I said, choosing any of the five Thunderbird machines, I just couldn't choose between them. I love them all equally, and I love them as much as I love Fab One, but Fab One wins this list easily, and I'm gonna explain why. So we must remember who's watching Thunderbirds because it's all right, I was watching it at our age, out of nostalgia and sheer enjoyment and everything, but it's aimed at children. So a 21 foot long, 200 mile an hour, six wheeled, bulletproof, bomb proof, machine gun armed, hydrofoil boat, ski up mountains, Rolls Royce is absolutely bonkers but i love it but in the broader context as well of 
Jerry Anderson shows that we've been talking about. Thunderbirds, he's the greatest one of them all. It may not be the most well written at times, it may not be the most well acted at times, but the whole package is absolutely brilliant. It captured the zeitgeist at the time. It captured the zeitgeist again when it was repeated in 1992 and again in the early 2000s. Thunderbirds is the greatest Jerry Anderson show and Fab One is the greatest Jerry Anderson vehicle in that show. What one of the issues was with Thunderbirds is that I genuinely do feel that the Tracy brothers in general do lack a lot of character and a lot of heart and a lot of soul. And okay, it's hard to emote that with a marionette and voicing one and moving one and everything like that, especially with the technical limitations of 1965. But the combination of Aloysius Nosy Parker and Lady Penelope Crichton Ward is just a absolute bombshell of a combination. It is brilliant. There's so much subtext going on there between the two of them. There's that kind of tension between them, which you don't really pick up on as a kid, but you pick up on a bit as an adult. But also it's very important when you're making shows for children that you tell a really good story and a really engaging story. And those episodes featuring those two and Fab One were always the best for that. And when you engage children to watch science fiction, as I've said before, you're not just letting kids watch science fiction. What you're doing is you're nurturing the next generation of scientists and engineers, which are just absolutely crucial to our world. Another important thing that Fab One does is it teaches little boys the world over that gigantic pink cars are really cool and really fun. But I think what it boils down to really is just how entertaining that car actually is. It, I think the Thunderbirds machines, they lack soul. They really do. They lack any personality and any soul to them. Whereas Fab One had that in abundance. It had real personality. And let's have it right. Thunderbirds' biggest nemesis was the hood. And the one time he mixed it up and tangled with Fab One, he lost big. But for all of that, for everything I've just said, this entire list of what I've just said, if you're a kid and you're playing Hot Wheels with your friends, and no matter what you're doing, whether you're having a little war with them or you're having a little race with them or whatever, right? if you turn up with your collection of Hot Wheels, and you pick this one out, it means whatever race that you've entered, you have won. And that is why Fab One is the number one Jerry Anderson vehicle. If you've made it this far, thanks for watching the video. Please give a like and a subscribe because it really does help out with the channel. I do enjoy making these videos and I had to make this video because it was a fun video to make compared to the last video I made, which is still haunting me, if I'm honest with you.